All right, so this is, uh, we're still uh, lecture week five uh, on uh, explaining, defining, and measuring poverty. And then now we're switching to uh, the second part of this lecture, which is a bit more technical. We're talking about defining uh, and measuring poverty uh, and how the Census Bureau goes about that process. And so first, we start with some basic definitions, some working definitions of poverty. And in this class, we take a somewhat of a narrow view of poverty. There's so many different dimensions of poverty, uh, much like uh, in diversity, there's various dimensions. You could uh, quite conceivably talk about uh, relational poverty. Uh, there's, uh, there's, of course, that aspect of poverty. There's asset poverty. Uh, there's income poverty. So we take an economic view. We take uh, an, an income deprivation view of poverty, in other words. So uh, basically lacking the resources to maintain a minimally adequate standard of living is how we define poverty. We take that economic approach. Uh, and then there's sort of an intuitive sense of poverty. And this is given by Adam Smith, who's often credited with being the founding father of modern economics. And he has this to say about poverty. This was back in the 1800s. Uh, I'm sorry, in the 1700s. He said, uh, poverty is whatever the custom of the country. And so I add emphasis on those terms, custom of the country. So poverty is a fleeting term. It, it's, uh, it changes over time. So it's whatever the custom of the country renders it decent for even uh, people of the lowest order uh, to be without, he says. So uh, for me, my interpretation, if, uh, if it seems like everyone in your society in a given time period has an I iPhone, I'm sorry, I, maybe I should make that an iPad. If everyone has an iPad and you don't have an iPad, maybe that's considered uh, to be poverty under this, uh, under this definition. Whatever the custom of the country renders it indecent for people to be without. All right, so that's just an intuitive sense of poverty that was given by our uh, founding father of modern uh, economics, the capitalist system. So uh, this is uh, a traditional, uh, we're talking about uh, working definitions of poverty. We have three different definitions of poverty. We have absolute poverty, relative poverty, and subjective poverty. These are how, uh, uh, this is how poverty is defined by uh, researchers. There's uh, absolute poverty, which is expert-based. Uh, the expert researcher says this is the cutoff. Uh, this is a standard. Uh, and so anyone with income below that standard is considered uh, to be poor. That's what we mean by absolute poverty. Uh, and then we have relative poverty, which is uh, based on others in society. We compare ourselves to, uh, ourselves to others. And so the typical standard that's used by researchers is to take uh, the median uh, income, the median family income, so take that 50th percentile family and take that income amount, take 50% of that amount. And so that's the standard that's used internationally typically to look at relative poverty. And then the last uh, working definition of poverty that we have here uh, is in, in the way of subjective poverty. This is uh, simply in the mind of the beholder. So it's a product of individual consciousness. It's whatever you think poverty is. So if someone asks you, uh, how much do you think you need to get by? That's uh, your response would be a subjective uh, view of poverty. So we have these three different working definitions of poverty. In terms of why we measure uh, poverty, so I give you a case here about uh, why we do so as liberal uh, scholars. So uh, as a liberal scholar, our concern is, uh, uh, is in fighting poverty and measuring our progress in that fight against poverty. So the poverty estimates, by measuring poverty, it gives us a sense of where we are in terms of our progress in the fight against poverty. It also tells us where we can channel our limited resources. Uh, so there's always uh, a, a climate of limited resources. Uh, so measuring poverty and identifying where poverty is, uh, is sort of uh, located, that uh, tells us where we need to channel those limited resources. And poverty is certainly a political issue uh, as well. Uh, the poverty estimates, the official poverty estimates get released in September of each year. And so every time those numbers are released, uh, the government uh, pays attention uh, to those numbers. Uh, and so it's a political issue uh, as well in terms of why we measure poverty. So different justifications here for why we actually measure uh, poverty today. So uh, this is uh, something that I do with my face-to-face -face classes, but I want you to take a second here, uh, maybe a couple minutes, and think about this little thought experiment. Uh, and I want you to compare, uh, I'm going to ask you to estimate something, and we'd, I'd like you to compare your estimate later on to the official poverty threshold, right? So here, uh, imagine that you have a family of three. Uh, you have one parent, and then you have two kids. One child is 10, uh, 10 years old. You have a 10-year-old girl, and then you have an 8-year-old boy. Uh, living in Chicago, uh, we'll just make it Chicago, and we'll make it for 2012. I say 2012 because that's the most recent year for which we have official uh, census data. And so I'd like you to think about how much that family would need in the way of food. Uh, but well, first, let's talk about let's think about rent. How much might that family need in the way of rent and utilities? Uh, and jot down a number, either mentally or on a uh, note uh, piece of paper. Excuse me. And then think about how much that family would need in the way of food. How much does that family uh, pay in the way of uh, food, 
And then how much does that family need uh, for all other expenses? So if you think personal expenses are uh, should be considered, uh, then you can include uh, that amount there. And so hold on to that estimate, uh, and you can compare with that estimate how that uh, estimate compares to the official uh, census thresholds. Uh, so I'm looking here historically about how we uh, went about measuring poverty uh, historically for the first time. This was back in the 1960s, and you had a researcher by the name of Molly Orshansky, who was the very first to measure poverty for our uh, government. She was working at the Social Security Administration, uh, doing some research on the elderly population, and she was charged with the, resp with the responsibility of coming up with our very first poverty estimates. And she uh, did so by taking the USDA food budgets. Uh, there are various uh, food budgets that are put out by the USDA. And she, she took one of the lowest food budgets, and she multiplied that cost by three under the assumption that most families during that time were spending one third of their budget on food. And so she determined uh, our very first poverty thresholds or standards. And then she took family income. She took uh, a sampling of family income nationally and she assessed that family income against uh, those thresholds to come up with her very first uh, poverty estimates. So the intent was not that these, uh, these thresholds and these estimates would be used uh, the way that we do today in establishing eligibility for different programs, but uh, we've sort of taken these Molly Roshansky thresholds and estimates uh, and we've put them to various uses uh, today. So that's just a little bit of background in terms of uh, how we uh, first started uh, measuring poverty here in the U.S. So in terms of uh, how the Census Bureau, the Census Bureau is, uh, is the official uh, body that's responsible for measuring poverty in the U.S. And they have to consider uh, four different factors. So first, they have to consider uh, what type of resources to count. So should we be looking at income? Should we be looking at assets? Uh, what about health insurance benefits? What about uh, things like uh, EITC benefits? Uh, so uh, they have to think about the appropriate resources that should be counted when they estimate poverty. Uh, they also have to think about the unit of analysis. Should we be looking at poverty on a family uh, unit basis? Should we be looking at household poverty, individual level poverty? So that's another consideration. And then they have to consider the appropriate threshold. What do we use as the cutoff? Should we use Molly Urshansky's uh, 1960 cutoff? or should we use some other uh, cutoff for our society today? Uh, and then they have to consider also the appropriate time frame. So should we be looking at poverty on an annual basis, on a monthly basis, on a more long-term basis? Uh, these are uh, four sets of factors that the Census Bureau considers when estimating poverty uh, uh, for official government purposes. And so first, in terms of uh, resources, uh, the Census Bureau considers gross cash income. Right, so gross uh, cash income, so this is pre-tax uh, pre-transfer income, so things like uh, your link card benefits, right? Your food stamp benefits aren't counted when the Census Bureau estimates poverty. So any sort of taxes uh, paid or transfers for that matter. So your EITC benefits aren't counted when the government, uh, when the Census Bureau estimates poverty. Uh, so non-discretionary expenses are also not counted. So those things over which you have no control. Uh, so things like child support payments, uh, alimony payments, those things are not counted when the government, when the Census Bureau estimates poverty. And then in terms of uh, the appropriate unit of analysis, the Census Bureau uses the family unit. So not the household unit, which is uh, on a larger scale, not the individual uh, unit, uh, but the family unit. So anyone related by blood, marriage, or adoption, uh, everyone's family uh, resources are counted when measuring poverty. Uh, and so if you're living with a boyfriend or girlfriend, the Census Bureau won't count boyfriend or girlfriend's resources. They won't count uh, the same-sex partner's uh, income resources uh, if you're living in a dorm. So your roommate, your roommate's uh, resources aren't going to be counted by the Census Bureau when they release their official poverty estimates. Uh, the Census Bureau also have to, has to consider the appropriate threshold that we should use, and they uh, basically use the Molly Orshansky threshold uh, that was determined in the 1960s. So uh, basically the, the low-cost food budget multiplied by three adjusted for changes in prices over time. So prices have certainly changed, and uh, the poverty threshold has changed with the consumer price index uh, over time. And of course, it's different for families of different sizes. Uh, it ranges, uh, there's different thresholds uh, for families uh, that are uh, that, that are comprised of one person uh, to, to nine people or more. So there's different thresholds uh, depending on family size. Uh, so note that there's uh, numerous criticisms out there. I just, I, I'm just making note of three criticisms of the way in which Molly Orshansky determined the thre this threshold and the way we use this threshold today. So first is uh, the first criticism. Uh, is the idea that food comprises one-third of a family's budget. So uh, critics will point out that this is outdated, that the, that the research shows that families spend one-sixth of their budget on food nowadays. So they say, why don't we multiply uh, the food budget by six instead of by three? Uh, 
Uh, so that's one particular criticism. Another criticism is that uh, that threshold isn't adjusted for regional differences in cost of living. So the threshold that we determine uh, doesn't differ. Uh, it's, it's the same in Chicago as it is for the boonies somewhere in Wisconsin as it is for more expensive places like New York City or Honolulu, uh, Hawaii. So uh, that, the suggestion, of course, is that we should be adjusting for regional differences in cost of living. And another criticism, a little uh, more nuanced criticism here, is that we don't adjust for changes in standard of living. Uh, I noted before that we do change, uh, we do adjust for changes in cost of living. Uh, we just don't adjust for, uh, for differences in cost of living regionally, but we do change, uh, uh, we do adjust for changes in cost of living over time. That is, we adjust these thresholds based on inflation, but the suggestion is that we should be adjusting these thresholds based on wages, changes in wages or, or, or income as opposed to prices. There's uh, wage indexing, we call it wage indexing versus price indexing. The suggestion is that uh, we should be wage indexing as opposed to price indexing uh, these thresholds. So just a few of the criticisms out there uh, in terms of the Molly Oshansky thresholds. And then finally, we have to, uh, or I should say the Census Bureau uh, has to consider the appropriate uh, time threshold, uh, not a time threshold, but the time period. Uh, so they look at poverty annually. So what they'll do, what the Census Bureau does, uh, they'll take the current population survey, which is a data collection effort, uh, they'll take that data, uh, they'll collect that data from March uh, on through the summer uh, in a given year, and then they'll uh, run those numbers, they'll crunch those numbers, and they'll release those numbers in September of each year. So uh, the most recent data that we have is from September 2013, and that's the release of 2012 data, which they collected from March through September and manipulated. Uh, and so uh, we, we report poverty on an annual basis, not on a monthly basis, not on a long-term basis, uh, the long-term basis is the more pervasive concern. Uh, there's, a, there's a big concern over long-term poverty, but we issue poverty estimates, the Census Bureau does, on an annual uh, basis. So uh, recall that I had uh, asked you individually for your own subjective views of the poverty thresholds, but this is the official poverty threshold that's uh, determined by the Census Bureau. And so you'll note here that for a family of three, the poverty threshold is 18,284 for 2012. Uh, so on a monthly basis, if you're thinking in monthly terms, most uh, students do, uh, it, would, it would come out to a little over $1,500 per month. That's considered uh, to be poor nationally uh, in the U.S. If you have less than $1,500 a month, you're considered to be poor by Census Bureau standards. Now I note here, and of course that differs for families of different sizes, and I note on the bottom here uh, an alternate measure of poverty that's uh, released, uh, that's used by other countries. So we, uh, we measure absolute poverty in the U.S. Other countries typically measure relative poverty. Uh, and so to do so, uh, they look at uh, median family income, uh, which was uh, somewhat high in the U.S., $62,000. If you took 50% of that amount, you would get $31,000 uh, and some change there. And so you might say anyone with less than $31,000 of uh, family income might be considered poor under relative definition of poverty. So I just uh, that's just a quick note uh, that I include here. That that's an alternate measure of poverty that we might use internationally. So to answer the question of who's poor in the U.S., uh, let's use the absolute poverty threshold uh, that's, uh, that's used by the census, right? So we're considering pre-tax, pre-transfer, gross income, uh, uh, that we're taking resources of, the fam of all the family members, and then we're going to assess against the Molly Oshansky threshold uh, on an annual basis. We're going to take annual income. Uh, and so I show you who's, uh, in fact, poor in the U.S. So poverty... Uh, and you can quote me on this, this is uh, straight from the Census uh, Bureau, but poverty is at 15%. So 15% of all individuals in the U.S. are in fact living in poverty according to the census, according to the 2013 release of 2012 data. So 15%, you see the different breakdowns in terms of race, ethnicity, poverty is highest uh, among, I'm sorry, among blacks. This is at 27.2% uh, for people identifying as black alone or in combination. So some people uh, self-identify with more than one uh, race. Uh, and then you have uh, different age groups. Uh, poverty is highest uh, for kids. So poverty is at 21.8% uh, for uh, those under 18. Notice how the poverty rates, uh, what I just showed you before, differs from the poverty composition. It's a much different picture. So here I note all, uh, this is the absolute number of people living in poverty in the U.S. So we have 46.5 million people uh, living in poverty. So when we look at poverty composition, so be critical of the literature on this. When you see literature reporting poverty rates and poverty composition, uh, poverty composition isn't looking at the risk of poverty. It's looking at, well, 
among the poor, uh, what do the poor look like? What's the breakdown of the poor? And so this is the breakdown among 46.5 uh, uh, million people living in poverty. 40% or close to 41%, 40.7% are in fact white. That of course is much different than uh, our poverty rate. So among the poor, 40.7% are in fact white. And part of that is just due to the fact that we have more white uh, persons in our population than uh, other eth ethnic uh, racial backgrounds. And then we have uh, poverty composition where poverty rates were highest for kids. Uh, poverty composition is highest for uh, those who are working age, so those between 18 and 64. All right, so uh, poverty rates as distinguished from poverty composition is what I'm reporting here. Uh, so just a quick note, uh, just to give us a better sense for what we mean by that 15 percent. Uh, that 15 percent uh, hasn't changed uh, for a couple of years. So uh, in 2012, we have 50 percent, 15 percent poverty rate. In 2011, we had a 15 percent poverty rate. Uh, for 2010, if we're looking at trends, if we're uh, expanding the time horizon, 2010, we were at 15.1 uh, at, uh, percent. In 2009, we were at 14.3 percent. In 2008, we are 13.2 percent. So the general trend, if we look back 10 years, the general trend has been upward, so we've gone from 12% to 15%, generally speaking. Uh, and then if we're looking at subgroups and seeing if there's any significant change between 2011 and 2012, typically you'll see changes of greater than 1%, but for, uh, but for the 2011 to 2012 time span, I didn't see any significant changes uh, for different subgroups. Uh, so just uh, a little more context here in terms of how we think about that most recent estimate of 15%. We compare across time, across different national contexts, uh, to give us a better sense for what that 15% means. And so here, uh, I'm noticing uh, here, uh, I'm noting here in terms of uh, time trends. So when we first started measuring poverty in 1960, poverty, uh, the poverty rates uh, were at an all-time high. So this bottom line here are the poverty rates. The poverty rate was at 22.1% uh, when Mali Oshinsky first started measuring poverty. And then during the great, uh, the great Society era, or the War and Poverty era, this is Lyndon Johnson's administration, uh, poverty went down, and uh, since the 1960s, poverty has essentially fluctuated between 10 and 15 percent, and we're at 15 uh, percent today. Uh, this top line is looking at just the absolute number of people living in poverty, uh, and so we're at an all-time high in terms of the absolute number of people living in poverty at 46.5 uh, million people, as you can see from this uh, line graph. And then these vertical, uh, these shaded regions, refer to recessionary periods when the economy uh, is stagnating or maybe even uh, declining. And then here we're looking at poverty across nationally, so across, uh, across national borders. Uh, the line on the left, uh, the dark blue line, is looking at relative poverty. So uh, this is looking at a median family, 50% of median family income, using that as a threshold. You notice that the U.S., has the highest relative rate of poverty. So, so you'll notice these numbers are just a bit dated. From 2000, it's hard to come by international data. Uh, so I give you the most recent, uh, recently, uh, recently available uh, estimates. Poverty, uh, the relative poverty rates, like I said, are highest in the US, followed by Ireland. Uh, and then you'll note here, uh, some of the countries that are doing much better. So Sweden and Finland, uh, some of the Scandinavian countries uh, that have much generous, uh, much more generous uh, social welfare benefits they do much better in terms of addressing poverty. And then uh, you'll have in the light blue here, the light blue bars correspond to absolute poverty, the way we measure poverty in the US. Absolute poverty was highest uh, in 2000, uh, in, 2000 uh, in the UK, and then the US uh, was second. So US, one of the highest rates uh, of poverty, whether, measure, whether we measure relative poverty or absolute poverty uh, across, uh, across nationally. So in the next part of this lecture, we'll get into a larger uh, a broader discussion about uh, how the government historically has, has addressed uh, this poverty, the work effort conundrum simultaneously.